slippery. I pray right now over all the hearts, God, that are experiencing that fear and that angst against starting new relationships and and against forging a deeper relationship with you, God. I just pray that you fill that void and deliver your peace that surpasses all understanding which you have promised us, God. Lord, I pray for renewed yeses to you in this season, God. Hello, lifters and listeners. Welcome back to the Lift Her Up podcast. I am your host, Latrice. And if you have been rocking with me for a while, then welcome back. But if you are a new subscriber here, then just welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Y'all, the channel has grown (laughs) overnight, literally overnight. And I am at a loss for words. I did not expect for the last episode to do what it did. The response that I received from the fear of intimacy part one is very overwhelming, but in the best way, I promise. (laughs) Like I said, I didn't expect the views to be what they were. And honestly, it was because it was real random to me. It was very random for me because every week I just get on here. I say what the Lord has me to say. And I said what he gives me in my own way, in my own voice. And that's it. I go about my business. (laughs) Like I just, uh, I just try to show up in the way that he has called me to show up and that's it. So I've just been consistently doing that. Um, the episode is really not different from the things I normally talk about on the channel in regards to content wise. So again, very unexpected to me, but the timing of it is all God. And I am beyond grateful because he has exceeded anything that I have asked for and my thoughts completely. So he knew what he was doing and I am just blessed that He decided to use that particular video to reach you all who have recently joined our community here with Lift Her Up. So I'm excited to have you guys part of the community. Please, I love interaction. So make sure that you continue to comment and and like and share it with your friends and your family if it's speaking to you. Let me know if if the content is touching your heart, if it's changing your mind, if it's changing your your ways and all that. If God is speaking to you through it, that really keeps me going and it lets me know that I am on the right track because when you know God has promised you something, it's like I didn't doubt that God was going to do it. Right. But when you, you're showing up and it's like, well, you're just used to the way things are going. It ebbs and it flows and it, it stays, it steadily grows. But that, that last one kind of just skyrocketed. <laughs> I did not expect it to do that. So yeah, welcome. Welcome. That's my little spill. Welcome to the channel. And I can't wait to get to know more about you all about you all. Now, the Lord has exceeded my prayers about it. Y'all showed out with this fear of intimacy part one. And I said I would do a part two. So I'm treating last week's video for the fear of the Lord as a part one A (laughs) because y'all were so ready for me to do part two of fear intimacy. And apparently God was ready too, because here I am. He gave me another download and some more things to discuss and talk about. So here we are fear of intimacy part two, part two. And I have titled this part two naked and afraid. Yes. Naked and afraid. Let's give it some time to breathe. I know, I know that was a lot, but why naked and afraid? Why? Because we are going to go back. We're going to look at scripture and we are going to go back and talk and dissect some things in scripture that gives us um, the origin of where our fear of intimacy comes from and the original design that God had for intimacy with us and how that design got so messed up in the process and why it continues to be an issue for us today. 
Okay, so let's get into it. Going back to the beginning where it all began. Let's read in Genesis 2. I am at verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Here's verse 22 through 25. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called a woman for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother in bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked yet felt no shame. Now, remember that last piece about them having no shame, because we're going to revisit that next Genesis three and one. Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No, you will certainly not die. The serpent said to the woman, in fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That was verse four through five. So reading that little chopped up sections of Genesis two and three, what does this show us? Let's notice something real quick. The enemy who was talking through the serpent waited until after God had given specific instructions to Adam and Eve. This shows us, shows us that the enemy is sneaky and that he will camp out and wait until you are in a waiting period. And he's trying to catch us after we've heard from God so that he can steal from us, whether it be wisdom, our faith, um, strategy, strength, Anything that the Lord is trying to pass down to us before we make it to the next checkpoint. He's trying to steal it after we hear from God. It also shows us that the enemy will wait for a time when we are most vulnerable in our intimacy with God. So take note that Adam and Eve were not out of God's presence. They were still in the garden. God was still walking among them, but they were between instructions. So at that moment, God was not actively speaking to them. He had given them a word. He told them an instruction and he allowed them to be married, enjoy the garden, all of that. Isn't that like a lot of us, we get a word from God and then we're like, okay, Lord, well, we're going to work on this. We're going to work on this. I heard the instruction. And while we're tending to that instruction, Adam, go take care of the animals, take care of the land. Don't eat from that tree. Right. After that instruction, it's like, all right, now we're working, we're working, we're working. And then in the midst of that, the enemy comes and tries to pervert the instructions that God had given them. So this is not a new tactic from for the enemy at all. He did it again in Matthew four with Jesus, the tempting of Jesus in the wilderness. He tempted he tempted Jesus while he had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness when he knew he was suffering and he was hungry. He brought him to the top of the mountain and was like, if you are the son of man, why don't you do this? If you are the son of God, why don't you do these things? Again, waiting for Jesus's most vulnerable moment after Jesus had an instruction and a prompting from God, because remember the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. So an instruction came and then the enemy came there after to try to disrupt it. So the enemy tries to disrupt God's perfect design for our intimacy with him by using doubt and deception. And we will talk about this doubt and deception and how it feeds into fear of intimacy. Because again, the enemy will use the same tricks today and we have to be dialed in so we know how to not fall for it so we can know how to withstand the attacks of the enemy. Going back to the garden, he challenged 
to Eve when he was asking Eve, surely did, did God say that? Certainly you won't die. In the garden, he challenged the validity of what God was saying, which planted doubt in Eve and Adam to question who God is, to question their identity in God. And if God was somehow withholding a perceived blessing from them. Remember, in the first part, we were talking about our trust issues the last time and how many of us suffer from trust issues with God. So I have to ask, like, has there been a moment in your heart where you have questioned God's intentions towards you? You've asked, well, Lord, how do I know that it's really going to work out the way you said it's going to work out? How do I know that what you said is true? How can I really believe what you're telling me about this situation when I'm being offered contrary information about it? So I focus on this part of the story because I think it's important that we talk about the tempting in and of itself in conjunction with the that fear of intimacy that the enemy tries to feed us. So temptation will always present itself as something that is better than what we already have, right? So it will always be an offer that looks brighter and shinier and more golden and more tasty than, <laughs> than what you already have. So obviously it looked very tempting to Eve at the time. And it will always speak to our ignorance, which are the things that we don't know in attempt to sway our curiosity another way. So the enemy had to be like, oh, are you really? Did he say that? You're not going to die. He knows that if you do eat that, then you'll be just like him. Peaking the curiosity in Eve's brain to be like, I wonder, maybe I do want to know that, which wouldn't have been a bad desire because desires aren't all bad, but it's just in the way that she ended up going about it. She was deceived into that. So Adam and Eve were, they were presented with, with a temptation and they became susceptible they became susceptible to learning something that that they had no business learning yet. God was still waiting, I'm sure, for the the chance to to walk with them and to show them what life truly was. And we see that as the story goes along. So the enemy piqued their curiosity and swayed their curiosity towards trying the fruit and towards um, knowing what good and evil truly were. So my question to you is, what has swayed your curiosity away from the presence of God? And when you trace your answer, you will most likely find the enemy because, again, his agenda is to keep us out of God's presence. So if there is something in your life that is piquing your curiosity to the point where it is pulling you away from the presence of God, it makes you be like, hmm, I'm going to do this instead of reading my Bible. I'm going to do this instead of praying um, in this moment. I'm going to do this instead of going to church today. I'm going to do this instead of asking a friend to, to pray with me on this. I'm going to do this instead of fasting. What is that thing? That's probably where the enemy is trying to, to be at play and to keep you out of God's presence. Let us keep reading Genesis three and eight. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, and he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Then he asked, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. Genesis 3, 8 through 12. That last part of the passage always tripped me out because I really, okay, Adam, you're going to put it back on God now. The woman that you gave me. Isn't that part of the fear of intimacy as well, though? We start to 
victim blame. We start to to shift blame onto the other person when we <laughs> when we were the active party in in the problem in the situation. Well, Lord, you gave it to me, so I I was just I was just going along with what you said. No, a good or well that the Lord gave you the instruction to not eat from the tree, and it was your responsibility to shepherd your wife in this situation. Just the same way, it's our responsibility to shepherd our relationships, to shepherd our our journeys, our lives, our paths in the way that God has instructed us to. So. Adam, he thought he was slick, but he is not, he's not innocent party in this, the the woman that you gave me. (laughs) But I also love this passage because God already knew what happened with Adam and Eve that they had eaten the fruit. But Adam, he still asked Adam, where are you? And did you eat from this tree that I told you not to? And I love that because it represents a father to child relationship. So if you have kids If they do something wrong and you know they did something wrong, you're still going to ask them, what did you do? What happened? Because you're waiting for them to divulge the fullness of the story. Why? Because you want them to know that truthfulness is important. The importance of telling the truth, that the truth is freeing and that lying has consequences. And I think there's also a part of parents that want their kids to be able to come to them with the fullness of the truth. And, and not have any fear. So I, I just love that imagery that even though God already knew what happened, he still, he still had to have Adam say it out of his mouth. This is, this is what happened. This is what we did to, um, to give the value of telling the truth. Then Adam said, I was afraid and naked. So I hid. And that brings us to our title, Naked and Afraid. Adam and Eve had no awareness of their nakedness until they sinned. So their sin is what made them feel ashamed. Have you ever sinned so bad? (laughs) Maybe even a little bit. And you felt so ashamed that you hid from God. So you sinned and you stopped praying. You sinned and you're like, I am not going to open this Bible You sin, I'm not going to church. I'm going to stop serving on this ministry. I just, I'm not joining no more prayer calls. I just feel so ashamed because you felt like God no longer wanted to be near you because of what you had done. Feeling as if you're too messy and too dirty for God. Like just, just too broken to be in his presence. I felt this way before. I really have. And I know many of us will be like, Lord, I sinned last night. Like I sinned yesterday. I sinned an hour ago, 30 minutes ago. I on the ride home, like, you know, (laughs) from work, um, I, I let my flesh take over. It did. It did. And just, just feel like I, like you can't go to him because of that. But the one thing that Adam and Eve didn't consider is that God created them naked. He created them physically naked, meaning they were vulnerable physically. And he also created them with no shame. They had no knowledge of it. And we need to realize that too. God created us naked with no shame. That's how he created us. So he already knows the naked pieces of us. So there's no need to be ashamed of something that he has created. And God is steadily trying to get us back into that place of no shame, of not having condemnation and not being ashamed before him because he has made us this way. He has created us this way. And he knows all of our weaknesses already. He knows we did the sin. He knew we were going to sin. And yet Jesus still chose to, to die for us anyway, even though he knew that we were going to do it. He knew, and he still sacrificed his, his life for us. And I want to talk to the person that is dealing with, with that, who has backslid and who feels like they are too messy for God and that they can't turn back into his presence. Jeremiah three fourteen. This is the, the King James version. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. The Lord is married to the backslider. 
And in other versions of this, backsliding translates into faithless, which means God is still faithful to us. He is still married to us when we are faithless and unfaithful to him. And it is because his grace and his mercy covers us always, all the time. So I hope you remember that when you are stuck, maybe in a, a cycle of sin, a backsliding, you're trying to get back in the right footing. Please don't think that you're too far gone for God to reach you and for him to still use you. Like there's still time to turn back. He is still faithful even when we are not out of his goodness, only his goodness, y'all, only his goodness. And we cannot allow shame to keep us out of the Lord's presence because God desires us. God desires you. He created you. He has engraved you in the palms of his hand. Um, he knitted you together in your mother's womb. You are beautifully, fearfully and wonderfully made. You are above and not believe, not beneath. You are the apple of his eye. You are chosen in a royal priesthood. Before the earth was formed, he knew you, he called you by name, all these things. He considered you, he considered you, and he has considered us all. And these are, um, these are affirmations tied to scriptures, honestly, but these are internal pep talks that we need to be having with ourselves to help com combat our fear of intimacy, saying things like God will withhold no good thing from me. All things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. I'm called. The Lord has called me. I love the Lord. Like, so that means everything is working out for my good. It has to, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it looks like. And so we have to get to the point where we have an exchange. We have to get to the point where we have an exchange or the fear is always going to remain. We have to implant the word of God. I got my Bible with me. We have to implant the, the word of God in our hearts so that when this fear does arise, we're able to fight it and not just and not just sit in it or not just wait for it to pass over or think that we we can't get past it or like we're not supposed to to get beyond it because we have this fear of going deeper with God and I wrote this down because I felt it as I was preparing for this but I, I have to say it that intimacy is not going to destroy you and it's only the enemy that is leading you to believe such lies and this is relational and also spiritual so just because you have risked intimacy in the past with a friendship, a relationship, a marriage, whatever, and it has come back to you void, you ended up hurt in the process, that does not give you the permission to only pursue shallow relationships, whether romantic or platonic, going on in the future. And that's the, that's the same with God. We cannot leave an abandoned ship just because the water starts to become troubled. And I think this is why God has called me into this space because I despise, I despise seeing people stuck in cycles that I know are avoidable and are teachable. And since many of us are in this cycle right now, I know it is a teachable moment. And the teachable moment is we have to stop allowing the enemy to punk us. We have to, because when we look at these stories, Adam and Eve in the garden, Jesus in the wilderness, the enemy, his greatest tool in those moments, even against our savior, listen to this was temptation. It was words. It was persuasion. Now don't get me wrong. He is, he is persuasive, but that is his greatest tool that he used in that moment, in that moment. So he can only try to persuade us. And if we give in to that persuasion, then we have forfeited our, our right and the blessing or the strategy that we might have received just because we gave up the fight before it really even started. So we have to, we have to stop allowing the enemy to get to us so quickly. He really doesn't have as much power as we think he does. 
And as we grow closer to God, we should expect to experience more problems with the enemy. We should expect to encounter warfare as we journey through the things God has called us to do as we as we grow in the things of God. We should expect that. And I had a comment from a community member um, and it was a, such a, a beautiful comment and I, I thank her for leaving it. I hope she's watching. But it was a good point about uh, the spiritual warfare aspect and spiritual warfare is very real. Y'all, it is very real. There is a very real God and there is a very real adversary. OK, and there are very real angels and there are very real demons and devils that are at the enemy's disposal that are seeking to devour us and um, are behind so many evil things in the world, but the enemy doesn't play fair. So I did want to give a moment to talk about that spiritual warfare and to give some strategy against that, because if there's a fear of the enemy attacking us, then we need to be proactive about how we can fight against that fear so that we can keep moving forward. I I said to her in the comments that the enemy has nothing on us. And I'll say that again. And the only way that he can come near us is if God allows him to literally the only way he can come near us is if God allows him to. And if we have forfeited our right to him, but God has given us every tool and every authority over him. And this goes back to my my episode I did last week about fearing God. So if we allow the fear of the enemy to keep us from obeying God and from going deeper in God, when we know the Lord has called us deeper, when we know that we're in a season that we have to be firmly rooted in God, if we know he's called us to do that, but we allow the fear of getting heckled by the enemy drive us away from intimacy and fellowship with the Lord, then we have made fear our idol. Then we've made fear. We place fear in the place that only God should be. So if you're dealing with that fear of the enemy attacking you, of his attacks becoming intensified, I would encourage you to study, not just read, but study the book of Ephesians, especially chapter six about the armor of God. And also to study through some of the Psalms, okay, because we serve, we serve the Lord of hosts. That is a very common name for God in the Old Testament. And that is because he is, he is the commander of, of heaven's armies. He is a a God, a God of war. (laughs) Honestly, like he is, he is, he is a warrior. The Lord is a warrior and, and he's not called the Lord the Lord of hosts for no reasons. He has never, he's never lost a battle. He has never lost a battle. All he does is win wars every time. Our Lord is not, he ain't a punk. (laughs) And the enemy came from him. Like the enemy, the devil is a created being. The Lord created him. So if the enemy has the power, you think he does. Okay. That is only given to him by God by the father. So if God could create that, how much more powerful, how much more powerful is the Lord? We as believers, we really don't have anything to, to worry about. The enemy can try to throw everything that he can at us. He can, he, and he can, he can tear up this body too. If he wants, he can, but as believers, we know that our souls are eternal. We are promised eternal life beyond this. And again, He can only touch us when God allows him to touch us. Read Job. I talked about Esther last week, too. We saw what happened when Haman was trying to take out the Jews, God's chosen people. We are God's chosen people, and he ain't just about to leave us out here to dry. The Lord is serious about his children, and it's only going to be so much beaten up (laughs) that he is going to allow. So I pray that that gives some courage to, to that fear and across the board to all the, all the fear of intimacy 
that I've seen the comments have been been flooded with the the amen corner of I'm there too, sis, and thank you for sharing this and um, I'm, I'm getting through this and I'm healing through this as well. So I pray that this gave illuminated some of the schemes of the enemy, honestly, because that's mostly what this was, how the enemy will implant that fear into us for to deceive us into staying out of God's presence. So I really hope that y'all enjoyed this episode, this video, this part two. Let me know in the comments. I'm actually going to pray before we end this episode. I felt the Lord was telling me to do that. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the viewers of this episode, God. I do not know everyone by name, Lord, but you do, God. You know them by name, you know them by heart, and you know them by spirit. God, and I'm just asking that you cover them in whatever situation that they may be going through. Lord, I pray against the spirit of fear right now in the name of Jesus. Any fear that is hindering them, God, from seeking your face more, from getting into their word more and discovering more about you. God, I speak against it right now. Lord, I pray that you renew in them a fire to seek you above all else more than they ever had before in their lives. Oh God, I pray right now, Lord, against all trust issues, all anxiety, all depression, Lord, any past traumas that they might have faced that has caused them to steer clear of deepening their relationships in their physical life and in their spiritual life. Lord, I just speak against it, God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you cover them, that you comfort them like no other. Jesus, I ask that you be be a healer that you are, Lord, the, the healing that you promised on Calvary. I pray right now over all the hearts, God, that are experiencing that fear and that angst against starting new relationships and and against forging a deeper relationship with you god i just pray that you fill that void and deliver your peace that surpasses all understanding which you have promised us god lord i pray for renewed yeses to you in this season god i pray that your people are able to stand boldly and courageously against the fiery darts of the enemy with their shields of faith oh god I pray that their minds are covered with the helmet of salvation and their hearts covered with the breastplate of righteousness, oh God. Their shoes shone with the with the shoes of peace, um, oh God, shot with the shoes of peace, oh God. And that they use the word of God as their as their sword, Lord, to, to cut through every lie that the enemy tries to throw at them, oh God. Lord, only you know where these people will end up and only you know their journeys, God. But we are thankful and we are rejoicing that there will be testimonies, God, of the deepening of these relationships with you, Lord, that the fear, the shackles of fear will be broken off of their lives and off of their generations, God, and off of their bloodline. Oh, God, we just thank you and we magnify you and we glorify you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Woo. All right, y'all. That was it. Fear of intimacy part two, naked and afraid. Do not be afraid to be naked before the Lord, right? I will see y'all next time. Thank you again for subscribing to our new community members. I love you all so much. Remember to like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, five stars, anywhere you can listen, Apple and Spotify. And until next time, stay encouraged. Bye.